Hello and welcome to today's webinar. We've got Chris O'Brien and uh, Jacob Finlay. We're excited to be with you guys. We're going to discuss something near and dear to us today. It's the ideal repair shop. Before we jump into this, a um, bit of housekeeping. Um, first, our bios. I'm the CEO and founder of Full Bay. I'm a CPA by trade. Chris O'Brien um, has many years experience in private fleet ma uh, management, Six Sigma Black Belt, brilliant operations expert. Yep, and the ideal shop is one I'm not working in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also housekeeping, how the webinar works. I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, what you'll see over on the right side of the screen, there's a toolbar with a little red arrow. You can make that bigger or smaller by clicking on that arrow. Uh, what we want you to do is uh, put in questions there that you have for us down at the bottom. And uh, just to make sure you understand it, go and put the, uh, the state or city or province that you guys are calling in from, and we can see that that's working over there. So any questions that you have, throw it in there. We'll try to get to all the questions by, by the end. And um, some of the things that we're, we're going to talk about should spur quite a few questions. So don't hesitate to throw them in there. Any that we don't get to, we'll follow up after the webinar. Absolutely. All right. We're going to throw a teaser on here. What you see here is, uh, you see that, Sharon? What you see there is a super graphic. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take this off here in a few seconds, but this is a, a model that we hashed out a bit ago about what the ideal diesel repair shop looks like. And uh, we're gonna come back to this at the end. We're gonna do some financial modeling, changing some, some inputs and see what, what impact certain levers make on the profitability of your shop. So, uh, lots of different ways to kind of skin the cat in terms of building the ideal shop, but this is this is kind of the big picture, so we'll come back to that. Before we really get into things, we're going to kick off our first polling question. So um, we would like to know, for those of you participating that have more than five employees, if your shop has more than five employees, do you have a parts manager, or you could call them a clerk, and a service manager? And uh, I'm going to launch this this poll here and uh, see what you guys got. So go ahead and respond on the screen. Lots of responses coming in here. So Chris, what you're saying, the ideal shop is? Oh, it's something where I'm not physically where working. Where you're not physically in it. working in yeah, it? Okay. Maybe I'm working on the business, but not in it. Chris is a voice. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I actually just uh, installed some brakes on an older rusted out vehicle. Uh, with my brother-in-law, and believe it or not, it is amazing when you put the left brake on the right side and the right brake on. <laughs> yeah, the opposite, causes problems. You'll never bleed the brakes. <laughs> so those of you who have never heard of it, you will never bleed the brakes. Uh, it's a quick and easy fix. Yes. Uh, definitely an amateur moment uh, when adding a few brewskis to the. Uh, well, good, good job, Chris. Uh, so poll results right here. Um, the 41% uh, of you said, yes, we've got more than five employees and we have parts and service covered by, by separate people. 18% um, have less than five employees. The rest are no or considering it. Okay, yeah. good to know. All right, diving in here. We wanna make a few points before we go into some financial modeling and really dig into that model. Uh, the first point we want to talk about is the people. Yeah, I think that, you know, what's interesting is that um, t text, I mean, it's pretty straightforward that text generate revenue by turning wrenches, right? If I'm a technician working for you in the shop, I'm best suited diagnosing, repairing, uh, really just working as many jobs as possible. If I'm out in the field chasing down parts or I've got other responsibilities, um, I'm going to be less efficient and possibly less productive. So having my techs clean the bathroom is not the best use of Exactly. Of and even at, at Full Bay, we've been talking, crazy enough, we were talking about, when we have employees clean up our workspace, it's cheaper. We want them focused on work. Tech should be focused on what they're good at. And I think we often have these conversations, Jacob, where you, you always remind me that a tech is actually worth your bill rate. So if you're billing your door rates $100 an hour, having the tech not work on something that produces $100 an hour, is actually costing you $100 an hour. There's an opportunity cost. There's an opportunity cost. I love it when you always bring that up. Yeah. And this is this slide here is obvious. 
it's super obvious, but it's always a good reminder to just kind of lay the groundwork for what we're going to do here in a few minutes because technicians are the ones generating, they're the front line generating the revenue in the shop. And I always think about, I even thought about playing the clip during this webinar, but I always think about the movie Groundhog Day when Bill Murray's like getting out of the van and pumps the tani and thinks he's going to have to be staying in this awful hotel and the producer says no I booked a great place for you and then he says this memorable line which is basically you know that's a sign of a good producer keep the talent happy <laughs> right and as he like goes away the producer and the cameraman are just making fun of him but I always think about that I mean technicians they really are the talent they're generating the revenue and it can be hard to find them you want to make the best use of their time so the next point here is the other staff so most shops don't just have technicians working there. They have other staff, like we talked about, parts managers, service managers. Uh, talk about that, Chris. What's the point of a parts and service manager? Well, yeah, I, I, you know, in its essence, I think what we've captured here is that they're 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 there to help enable the tech to be more efficient, right? They're they're general and their main role is at their to, core. Yeah, at the core is to to run flank, chase down the parts. I mean, if if we're looking for a turbo and you can't source it nearby or you've got to call three places to see if they've got it, let alone deal with the pricing issues that are out there. Um, the last thing you want to do is have a guy uh, unproductive chasing down that, that, that um, those items. Having uh, a tech sitting on hold with the parts house. Correct. Looking up and trying to be a parts expert. There is some finesse to being parts. I did inventory uh, for a while and I will say that I worked with some amazing people in inventory and uh, there's a knack to it. There's, there's definitely a recipe there. There's a knack. And once you get the patterns down, you really get in tune with where uh, to kind of cut through a lot of the um, minutia, right? You start, yeah. And you start thinking of different things like consignment or getting map pricing for a year or knowing who your best vendor is uh, without having to do a bunch of searches. Yeah. You know, there's wins and losses, right? It's not about the best price every time. It's about reliable service, getting it to you on time. There's a lot of things that to have to have a tech have to deal with all that sometimes is a little overwhelming, let alone that they need to be diagnosing another vehicle. If they got time for that, stack them up too deep, open another bay, keep them moving. Is, keep them moving. Talk about the service manager, service writer. What's the, you know, how, how does that role help the techs be more efficient? Yeah, I think sometimes it's, it's almost like a pro and a con, right? If you talk to some techs, they love to talk to the customer to hear what the real issue is, right? If I only talked to that person, I would have known it was this. But in reality, um, that customer interaction is great. It's got to be organized, facilitated, and it can gobble up a lot of time. You might have to walk out to the truck, see it, grab some information from the vehicle. There's just so much time gobbled up dealing with the, uh, the customer trying to just take down basic information name, phone number, address. And I think that in its essence, there's there's those components that are pretty basic. And then there's the other side of making sure the deal is profitable, giving the right estimates, setting good upfront contracts, right? So that's what the great service writers, in addition to enabling the text, help the shop ensure that we're, we're getting into something that we can solve, right? We're not providing services that we don't offer. We're not overextending ourselves. So they're really kind of holding some of the governance to the shop at the same time. We'll talk about upfront contracts in a future webinar. Yeah. Another another pretty powerful concept is uh, service writer, service manager, parts manager, they're able to run interference for the text and prevent the text from being interrupted as much, uh, which is a really important thing. If you've ever played, you know, uh, basketball and you, you get into what's called the zone, right, where you just, you're just like in a flow, you become super productive, you're making a lot more shots, you're, you're in that zone. If you if you get yanked out of that zone, it's really hard to get back in. And there's another uh, analogy with sleep. They say like REM, the deepest, most fulfilling, rejuvenating sleep. It takes a while to get into that, that deep sleep. And if you get woken up, you don't go back immediately into that deep sleep. It takes a while to get back in. The same thing with flow. So shops can tend to be an interruption factory where people are just getting interrupted left and right. You're yanking those texts out of their flow left and right. The more you can protect them, keep them turning wrenches, the better. Yeah, so. absolutely. And we see it firsthand right at Full Bay, even on the development side, you have a developer deep in a thousand lines of code, the last thing you want to do is pull them out of the code. So totally relatable yeah. across multiple industries, uh, the whole concept, keep them focused. Then of course, uh, just looking at the big picture, as an owner, as you're, as you're able to scale the business, more and more you want to be working on the business, not in it. You know, where there's, the, the, the time may come where you 
you take your toolbox home, you dress different, and so forth, um, and uh, and that's okay. And it, it, part of what we had on the model there is, you know, building your business where it's a nice, clean package that is self-sustaining. So I want to yeah. put that out there too. And what's, what I often find is that the business is built on the back of the owner, right? It's usually somebody who started it, whether through, you know, your father, or your father's father did it, or <clears throat> maybe just broke away from a shop and started your own company. And you did it off the sweat of your back and, um, and with friends, right? And maybe you're really good at it. Like you are an expert master mechanic. There is no better. But at the end of the day, um, if you're the one who's trying to manage the business and you're turning the wrenches, there becomes a diminishing return. Your expertise is better served growing the business and um, sharing the knowledge across the, the, the groups and trying to um, uh, kind of get uh, more predictable and stable processes. Absolutely. Yeah. Your five steps to an oil change are the exact ones that we follow every time. All right. The time. Make the process make it scalable. Yep. Okay. So the people, uh, quick polling question. Two out of three. We only have one more after this. In your shop, are you guys running service trucks um, with mobile technicians? I'm going to launch this poll here. Do you run service trucks or have, and have mobile technicians? Let's see what we got here. Super majority saying yes, it looks like. You guys are voting fast. Let's go ahead and close this and show the results. Okay, so 83% are a yes. Very, very few do not have mobile techs, which is interesting because we, um, I'm not surprised by that, but um, we've been having a lot of conversations with people in more of the light duty space. And the thinking there is no, why in the world would you have a mobile? Mobile technician, um, but I mean, all the, all, all the reason <laughs> heavy duty is very different. Yeah, it's definitely different. And I often find too, sometimes I'll run into a heavy duty shop that uh, maybe they've been taught that mobile mobile techs you can't be profitable with that. I don't know any other way to service an on premise. You know, you you, you have a large contract with a, with a large account. They have two hundred pieces of equipment. You're not gonna hire a yard hustler to drag equipment back and forth. And if I'm running that private fleet, I don't have time for you to hustle it back and forth. I want you to come out and drop oil in five units at one time. There's so, no better way to do that than with a mobile tech. So let's talk about that. Point number two is about tools. So the ideal shop, what kind of tools are in play? Um, and it just stepping back, once again, looking at high level, why, why do we even use tools? And at the end of the day, the tool also is there to make the tech more efficient. Um, you know, if you're not using the latest tools, um, including computer technology in your repair shop, you're really leaving money on the table. There's no question about it. Computer technology or, you know, the, the latest hardware tools. Yeah. I, you know, I've, uh, I've kind of subscribed to a bunch of schools of thought and I, I'll even buy a cheap tool every now and again, but I will tell you that I think most people that have been doing it long enough, if you don't buy quality tools and it's a pay me now, pay me later game. And right? quality usually means what? They're more expensive, right? Usually it costs a little more and um, you've got some sort of brand recognition behind it, right? And everybody knows there's a lot, a lot of folks think of Snap-on as just overpriced. Whether you get the deal, uh, you get a tool on a deal or you paid retail, it's a pretty darn good deal. Max a good, a good, a good tool. When you start um, having tools that break on you or that misdiagnose equipment because you saved a few bucks, that's bad for everybody in the shop. And I traditionally find most shop owners you find high-end quality industrial tools. Yeah, there's a lot of name brands out there, um, and some name brands have kind of uh, gone away. But the last thing you need, and I just ran into this when I was working on that truck, 15 millimeter socket. Brother-in-law had Craftsman. I have nothing against Craftsman. I've had Craftsman for 20 years. I grabbed the deep well Craftsman. I grabbed the shallow Craftsman. They were two different sizes. I don't know what happened to Craftsman, but I will tell you when I'm at home and I grab a Snap-on or a Mac. I don't have that problem. 15 mils at 15 mil. So uh, you don't want to be tripping over dollars to save pennies. We stripped out a bolt, yeah. and the next thing you know, we were with heat and had to have extractor tools. So all because of this, we figured out it was the socket was just slightly the wrong size from the manufacturer. It's funny. We were just talking about um, personally, I've been going through my tools and getting rid of the ones that don't make sense to carry anymore that aren't high quality and so forth. And we were talking about we had both bought the same drill press from Harbor Freight way back in the day, right? 
had the exact same issues. Same problem. Regret the purchase, <laughs> right? Like the handle's falling off and it really does make a difference. And um, of course that's in your personal life, you're saving yourself frustration and time, but in the business, that's money. That's, a, that's a lot of money you're saving yourself. So. I just did a, you know. So I, I embarrass mean, you to expose no, that you did buy a Joe Press from Harvard, right? Yeah, what's funny too is there's a, there's a, um, one of the, one of our customers, uh, he's a, he does fire work and he's out, out on the East Coast. He was telling me that he bought this cordless ratchet, and I'm used to air ratchets, right? It's loud. I'll put, I'll break out the air ratchet right in the neighborhood. Like everybody will come down from five doors each way. The O'Briens have the air ratchets out, right? Yeah. <laughs> right in the neighborhood. Um, but anyway, uh, I just did a cordless ratchet, and I, I was pretty impressed. I did a water pump on a 6.0 LS motor, and um, it's small equipment. Just big old batteries. Yeah. No, it's just a small, compact little ratchet. And right. If it wasn't for uh, Santo and uh, Hudson. Yeah. I wouldn't have bought it. He said, man, that is an awesome investment. Sure enough, it's probably one of the best investments. Quality tool, good brand. I mean, it, I am super, super happy. I saw a lot of those at SEMA. Uh, the, the bigger ones are getting the, to have massive batteries, like ridiculous. The batteries are bigger than the, than the actual 14 14.4. Um, so yeah, the concept of the tools, service truck for going mobile, shot management software, you, you guys get it. We're laying the groundwork here because it, at the end of the day, you're gonna have to shell out money for tools. Are you going to get a return on that? How and how much of how much of return you're going to get on a tool making the tech efficient? Where does that really translate into dollars? We're going to look at that in a minute. Yeah. Um, so just laying the groundwork here. Yeah. Um, so good segue. Expenditures. So what are the big expenses of a shop if you're doing things right? You're going to be paying for tech labor, right? It's definitely at the top. Uh, obviously, tech labor and parts are the two biggest expenses, but um, there's a lot. I mean, if you if you're maintaining a brick and mortar location, you're going to have to deal with rent, utilities, maintaining an actual physical facility, um, and insurance. If you're running legit, hopefully everybody's carrying insurance. I know it's harder to get these days, but um, those are all legit expenses. What level should your expenses be um, if you're kind of at scale and running your shop at about the level that you want it to be? What percent should your expenses be of revenue? Um, and also, you gotta you gotta understand that um, expenses don't all hit at once. Uh, sometimes shop owners will run into this problem where they get a big payment in, and they decide, you know, I'm gonna, I got money now, I'm gonna go buy a boat. It's not necessarily bad to go buy a boat, but what's your what's your take on that one, Chris? Yeah, I'm always uh, running the shop. You know, it can be a roller coaster, but I think there's a lot of hidden costs that are that aren't visible, right? So say I pay a tech 25 bucks an hour, I make a hundred dollars, right? Maybe I bill out 10 hours at a hundred bucks an hour, I'm paying them 25 an hour. If I don't consider all of the other costs that are involved, I've got to pay for, like you said, insurance. I've got to pay taxes on those wages. There's just so many, I've got overhead. By the time it all settles out, maybe it's 20 bucks I'm clearing. Maybe, uh, maybe it's less, it just depends on how much infrastructure it took to make that. I think Sometimes it's not often. Sometimes we'll, we'll I'll talk to a few people that are just a little short-sighted, living in the moment. But generally speaking, I think there's a lot of great operators that are out there, and they're trying to up their game, right? Maybe they're living in that moment. They're trying to get full bay to help them get some visibility and shine a light on some of the stuff uh, to get you know kind of better clarity on how much they're really making and how much time it really takes to get the job done. Um, interesting too. Uh, I. Don't know how some of these providers are doing it, but some of the large um, uh, third-party billing companies that are subcontracting, um, they're not allowing shop supplies to be charged. Right. So I would, you know, probably seventy percent of the shops we sign up say, "Oh, can you make one that's no charge shop supplies?" Right. Everybody else is five percent or eight percent. Um, and it just, I just answered this question this morning too. If you're a shop, generally speaking, that's out there in the U.S., even in Canada, if you charge a percent of labor, the average shop is between five on the low side and 10% of labor. So if you're anywhere in between five and eight, probably in the average in the sweet spot, right? Mm -hmm. If you're up at the 10, you're at the top end. If you're charging on the whole invoice, one and a half to maybe 3%. I've seen five a couple times on max, but one and a half to three, if you're doing the whole invoice, just as a sidebar. But I truly believe, Shop supplies are real. You've got uniforms, you've got cleanup, you've got all kinds of stuff going on at the shop. And if someone's not letting you charge for it, you got to get it back some other You way. have to make it up somewhere. You got to make it up in a higher rate or something. 
which inevitably gets you your money back. But it's super important if you're not char charging child support. Yeah, the, the true cost is somewhere between, what, 4 or 5% uh, of your revenue is the cost of the shop supplies. It really adds up. And um, there, there's a reason shops charge that piece. So if a majority of your customers aren't allowing it, or a big chunk at least, uh, you're right. I mean, richer markup scale, higher labor rate. We'll look at that. Yep. All right. Last polling question before we really get into the nitty gritty here. Do you know what your tech efficiency is? And uh, if you do, you know, is it under 100? Is it right at 100%, over 100%? percent going to launch this question here and uh, see what you guys got. Votes are coming in. Okay, looking pretty good. Very clean results. Nice round numbers. Okay, so 75% of you, your efficiency is running under 100%. 10% um, are at 100% or over, and then the rest are not sure. And that, uh, uh, that, that really bears out. Uh, what we're gonna show you in the ideal shop, you're running above 100% efficiency. There's a way to do this. There's a way to structure your shop in a way that you can do it. And um, it really does matter to your shop's profitability. In fact, nothing matters more than efficiency. Um, we'll see that here in a sec. Yeah, you know, we, when we go through this but, exercise, it's, it was pretty amazing just for me when we talk about some of these concepts. So the 5% so the over 100%, yes, it is doable, absolutely. It is doable. It is doable. Yeah, it's definitely doable. I think what's out with the challenge that we have that's out there when I'm talking to a lot of shops, they buy whole big because there's no way to track it. Or they're trying to track it after the fact and they're not getting real uh, metrics. Yeah. And I think that sometimes it's hard to take the next step, right? You've been running the shop, you're just using invoicing software. It's not really managing that, helping you manage the business. Right. It's helping you to produce invoices. I think. Once you get into full bay, you start to realize you have some other tools that help you manage it. And if you're thinking about it, you haven't uh, cut over and got the text fully using um, and tracking all their times and managing their times, the next couple of slides will definitely um, Here we show go. you why you might want to consider it. Here we go. All right. Um, before we jump into the actual model, let's just talk quickly about revenue. So at the end of the day, you can charge your customers for labor, parts, and shop supplies. Sublets in there too. Maybe you split out tires, but really labor, parts, shop supplies. And um, of course, you know, labor is driven by your labor rate, parts by your markup, and shop supplies, if you're able to charge it by your shop supplies rate. How do you, um, how do you increase your, your income? You could just crank up your labor rate or crank up your part. And if your labor rate's below market, we have uh, on the website, we've got a really good article explaining how to set your labor rate. It's where we got this, uh, uh, this picture. Um, really good methodology there, and it's something to seriously think about. If you're, if you're charging below market, it can actually be a good thing to charge um, higher than that, and there's good reasons for that. So that's one way, but it's not as effective as increasing efficiency. Same thing on parts markup, make sure you're using a good solid graduated markup scale. It's gonna fit the market that you're currently in. Different parts of the country, we see this, we see the data, different parts of the country can justify different markups. So you know what you can justify in your area. Make sure that you are charging that. Don't just charge, uh, Chris, you were just telling me yesterday, um, we're still seeing a lot of shops signing up for full bait who are just charging us straight. Uh, what's the percent that we? That yeah, we I just did 10 in the last few days from Friday. I don't, when you guys were at SEMA and I was kind of holding down the fort, I just did 10. And um, I, I want to say that over 50% of them were using a flat 20 or 30%. No graduated. No graduated scale. So $1 part marked at the same as a $500 part. Yes. Um, so that's a big one. Don't want to belabor that. But uh, And then shop supplies we discussed. So what we're going to show you in the model, we're going to open up Microsoft Excel and just do a basic um, diesel repair shop financial model, uh, heavy duty commercial shop, right? Financial model. And um, one of the things we're going to talk about is you increase efficiency one of two ways, increasing the number of build hours and uh, providing supporting labor. So managers, where it's justified. And, um, and just kind of underscoring that if there are people that are not technicians who are, if you've got people in your business who are not technicians, 
and they are not supporting the tax or making them more efficient, what are they doing in your business? That's a pretty compelling question. I mean, that's... Let's take, should we take a look? Yeah. Okay, so here's here's kind of the model that we showed at the beginning, and we can show this if you want it, uh, just comment, we can, we can get it over to you. I'm going to switch now. Um, actually, before I switch, one more slide. This concept of dial it up, right? So when you wake up in the morning, you can't just pull a lever and say, I'm going to, today I'm going to increase efficiency. I'm going to finally grab that efficiency lever and pull it. That lever does not exist. You cannot directly change the efficiency percentage in your shop. But there are levers you actually can grab and pull to increase it. A um, couple comments here, uh, an efficiency bonus, right? You know, um, uh, you can implement a bonus for taxi managers and I'll show you that um, here in a second. Make sure you're covering your costs on your labor rate. So set your labor rates where they need to be. Um, turn around your parts orders faster. Um, put some metrics in place to hold your parts team and your vendors accountable for getting you know, quotes and orders done in a timely fashion. And then uh, of course, make sure your markup is, is correct. So these are some levers you're gonna pull. Let's jump in to Excel. Sharon, can you see the screen okay? All right, this is a very basic financial model uh, for a shop. Let me walk you through this real quick. The grays here, where you see gray cells here, these are where we can change the inputs. And what I want you to really pay attention to is this column here, column D. This is your monthly P&L, your monthly profit and loss statement. And of course, at the bottom of that is your profit. So the way we have this set up right now is basically break even. You're making 500 bucks a month. You're basically not making any money in this shop. Working for wages. Working, and for, you, working for wages. You're paying yourself just enough to get by, keep the lights on, everything's going. And that could be normal when you're first starting out. And could be just, normal. Uh, cranking it up. So let's look at the assumptions before we change anything. Um, this is a shop. We're billing 85 bucks an hour. Our techs are costing us. Now this is fully loaded. So this includes all benefits, employer portion of FICA, everything fully loaded. In this example, 35 bucks an hour, which may be high or low depending on the area of the country you're in. But for this purpose, 35 bucks an hour, fully loaded cost of the tax. Uh, we're paying the tax 40 hours a week. They're billing 35. So that pops out an efficiency of 88%. Um, I've got an assumption around how much of the ticket is parts. We're marking up our parts 30%. That's it. 30% markup. 5% shop supplies rate. We've got four technicians. And of course, we know they're making fully loaded 35 an hour. Um, and we've got one service manager, no parts manager, and one office manager. And then we just threw in some numbers here. Um, may, may or may not reflect what, where you guys are, but just for the purposes of this model. So with all this going, I'm running a shop with four techs, two people in the office, and we're breaking even. Okay. What should we do, Chris? What, what do you want to test here? So, yeah. so, so, so going know, back, so yeah. what's, what's a lever that we could pull? Just so I think that to, to that point you made earlier, and I see this all the time, it actually will happen on the kickoff call. We're setting up your shop, and you're seeing that I have the example of $90, and you're billing $85, and you're like, oh, well, let's make it $90. Let's immediately, so let's, okay, so, so all right. that's a real one. Let's start, and I, see, I just did two kickoff calls uh, this morning. I have another one later on. That's exactly what we did. We started messing with these levers because they are in your direct control. You can pull that lever and it's your decision if the market will bear. So what happens if we throw <clears throat> $5 more per hour, $3 more per hour on that? Okay, let's, let's do that. Let's say and we make it 88 an hour. So yeah. watch my profit. I'm Right now I'm at 534 a month. If I change the labor rate from 85 to 88, watch what happens to my profit. Okay, another two grand a month. Right. Maybe I can squeeze out 90. So if you told me industry average was 90, we just moved somebody up five bucks an hour. Okay, place. so four so grand a month, we're, we're another 3,500 a month. There you go. All right. Okay, so that's that's great. That's great. Um, is, that is that life is that life-changing? No. Are you going to forget about that by the next day? Probably. That might pay the snap-on scanner tool bill. <laughs> you may piss off some customers, right? You could. I think that that's what's uh, difficult here is that if you're in market and the area that you're in, people are going to you because you're just starting your business or because you have a reasonable rate, that might not be the go-to. What if I'm already at the ceiling? Yeah. And if you're already at the ceiling, you might get a couple bucks. Maybe that's not the one. So let me bring this back down to 85. What's something else we could do? Uh, shop supplies. Always see the shop supplies. Okay. Any, uh, if, as soon as someone hears it's five to 10, 
sometimes if they don't even there may be either at two or three or four yeah they might bump it up to six or seven what happens if you move that up a couple points let's so shop supplies were five percent so we're back down to 534 what if i change shop supplies from five percent to seven percent what happens to my profit here we go all right thousand bucks a month small bucks. small bump um we usually see what eight percent yeah, it's it's kind of varies, but yeah, that gets us to two thousand. So basically, every point in this scenario is giving me another five hundred bucks a month. Okay, so we could do that. We could do that. All right. So uh, let me knock that back down. So that's basic. I mean, if I did eight percent shop supplies and ninety percent labor rate, now I'm doing okay. You know, five grand profit a month. It's not great. I'm not running out and buying a new service truck with that kind of money. Maybe if I could justify it, but I don't have enough money to hire a tech and a service truck, which is that alone. And I just put the whole burden on my customers. Correct. I just cranked up my customers' rates. All right, so bringing those back down, what's something else we could change? Well, if you're using FullBay or you have a shop management software that allows you to track tech efficiency and not the tech writing down, this is what I did and putting two hours, but knowing that they took 2.25 hours or 2.7 hours. Yeah. Let's, let's say what happens if you just build 100% of standard. Okay, so right now we're paying our techs 40 hours a week. They're billing 35 on average. You're yep. saying change that to 40. Do we have money? Could we, what if we gave them each a $100 bonus if we just hit 100% of standard? Is that? Okay, so you're saying, all right, let me make sure I understand the scenario. You want me to change build hours to 40 hours a week, get into 100% efficiency, and the incentive would be 100 bucks bonus on the check. Okay, 100 bucks a month bonus if we if we don't hit. All right, we'll we'll look at a different bonus scale, but that would cost me 400 dollars. Would that justify a 400 dollar cost? What what happens? Watch to my watch my profit here when I change the 35 build hours a week to 40. See that? Yeah. Suddenly we we just increased 8,500 a month. Is it worth spending 400 bucks? I would spend a week. <laughs> yeah, for a week. For a week would be worth it. I would be. Yeah. Okay. Um, now let's talk about bonuses. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch off this for a minute. So are you sure? Just to make sure I okay. I'm seeing this correctly. I can modify my labor. Rate. I can modify my shop supplies. I we haven't even gotten to parts markup. I can even modify my parts markup. Yeah. But none of that. It would take all of that to combine just to scratch the surface. Of just getting to 100% build hours, like what? 40 hours and build 40? Yes, Chris, that's right. It sounds like an infomercial. Yes, <laughs> that is correct. Well, by the way, we skipped parts market. Let's change that. So we got 30%. What if I switched that to, um, what was it, 42? Yeah. It's kind of the average. So it's, you, you're working with a graduated scale, ideally. So it's not just one rate, but if you look at the blended kind of average, if I make that 42, watch what happens to my 500. Okay, so that's Double pretty grand. good. So if I kind of level set everything, 42 there, maybe 90 there, and 8% there. I'm getting, I'm okay. I mean, I'm about 100,000 uh, annual profit. That's okay, right? It's, I would take that too. Yeah, you know I, mean, I mean, that's if not if my bad. market could bear and you're not doing that, we know for a fact 90 is kind of one of the lowest rates that's out there across the US. And we see a lot of shops not billing 90. That would be, and not doing shop supplies, that might be a good start yes, if the market could bear. bear. I mean, uh, to running a diesel, owning a diesel repair shop is very difficult emotionally and physically and in a lot of ways. Um, and you, there's other ways you can make that kind of money. Right? I like where we were going with efficiency. Okay, what if we so, cover the boat? What happens? Can I buy the boat if I could get my tax at 100%? I gave them a little piece of the action and we throttled up things just conservative. Okay, so let's let's keep all that there. So kind of at our recommended rate. I'm gonna go off of this. Let's talk about a potential efficiency bonus. So a couple of webinars ago, or maybe it was the last one, we talked about flat rate and it's controversial. Not everybody wants to do it. Um, an alternative to going to flat rate is introducing an efficiency bonus. So here is an example efficiency bonus scale that has actually been used in a shop. Um, here it is. So I've got, I'm gonna get rid of the assistance. Oh, you know, I'll just talk about it. So um, in this particular shop, the minimum efficiency required for all technicians to keep their job was 105%. It's a little bit draconian, right? Especially given the fact that 75% um, of the webinar participants are below 100%. Nobody's gonna wanna fire other techs. But in this particular shop, they, they lined it up. And let me just say one of the ways um, 
you can get these guys efficient is uh, tracking the PMs for your customers proactively. Um, they, instead of uh, just taking lock and work left and right, if you can if you can hash it out where, and this is on the model, where you're tracking the PMs for your customers proactively, you're doing all the DOTs, the wet service, dry service, and even other things that, um, that could help lower the cost of their fleet. If you do that for them, agree on a, on a, on a PM schedule, give them, get a key to their yard, right? Send techs out after hours to knock out PMs. You, everybody knows PMs are very, uh, you can get really good efficiencies with PMs, line up five trucks and do the oil change, right? Stuff like that. So at this shop, a lot of that stuff was going on. Um, but anyway, 105% minimum for all techs. Once they get to 110%, they start kicking in a bonus. This is a, uh, this was a weekly, sorry, a monthly bonus. So if I get to, I'm sorry, it's a weekly bonus. So if I get to 115%, I qualify for a weekly bonus of Hundred eight dollars, which for me as a technician is another fifty six hundred dollars a year. Um, so the question is, um, we just looked at going from what were we eighty five percent to one hundred percent. That justified a hundred dollar bonus. Just imagine what it would look like to go to one hundred fifteen percent, one hundred twenty five percent. Should we look? Yeah, so let's it looks look like, at it. Yeah. like let's say one hundred twenty percent. Is it worth kicking in another one hundred eighty bucks um, to my technicians weekly? To get to 125 percent let's go look that's that's nine grand a year and to to clarify we always see people and they they debate that if i pay you flat rate you'll do this anyway and what you're saying is an alternative to flat rate is this efficiency bonus kind of starts to achieve the same yeah you're aligning the incentive of the technicians to flat rate without having to actually pay them uh, flat, flat rate, rate and deal with um the drawbacks of flat rate so 125 yeah. percent. so what would that be um 40 hours, what was that 50? So if I bill 50, I get to 125%, look what happened to my profit number, just getting to 125%. And that's in one month. So that's what's one the month. annual? What's the annual one? Well, yeah, so the annual went up um, 345,000. So you can imagine that it's worth it kicking in 180 per check per yeah. week. I almost thought that that was too expensive. You couldn't afford 180 a week. And at this point, I would cut that check all day long. Think of it, yeah, you'll do those deals all the time. Think of it in terms of return on investment, ROI. Um, the investment is I will, you know, hold a bonus out there, $180 a week. If you hit the sufficiency number, look at the return that you get on that. Massive, right. massive. Um, and then going down the scale, in this particular case, they had an interesting approach where they would provide the technicians with an assistant, uh, you know, 10 bucks an hour, minimum wage, 12 bucks an hour, whatever it is, to help with the PMs, to go and you know turn filters and get get the oil draining and all that kind of thing, fetch a tool so that so the tech doesn't have to roll out from under the truck. And uh, in this particular case, they would provide an assistant, and you would qualify for an assistant at a certain level. Um, and uh, and then with an assistant, they were able to get to 150% efficiency. So there's an expense for the assistant, but it's not a huge expense and it provides a pipeline for future technicians. You can right. turn those assistants into technicians. Um, so, so I was just thinking that's a great pipeline training ground. You get somebody that's in school or yeah. always wanted to be a tech. You teach them the basic stuff. You teach them right with a master tech. So in a, a couple more things on here. Um, I, you know, you pay the bonus at the toolbox meeting, and uh, you know, some weeks there's four weeks you're getting paid. Some it's five, just because not every you know every every three months it's got an extra week. And uh, another thing going on here is um, sometimes you can you can also make the text efficient by designating a lead tech who's kind of overseeing a shift or is kind of kind of like the adult on the shift and is there to answer questions and it, it's going to drag that text efficiency down a bit. You want to make sure it's a really good tech, somebody that can answer questions. But for that lead tech, you would also kick in an efficiency bonus on top of their personal bonus. Uh, for leading the team. So to the extent that they can help the team become efficient, that tech personally also gets a bonus. So um, lots of different ways you can approach this, but you can see, if I go back to the model, let's just kick this up to, you know, from 50 to 60. Let's get it to 150% efficiency. Watch what happens to my monthly profit number now. See that, 150%. And you that's easily hire a $10 an hour employee now and pay for the bonus, and it's well worth it. You still have enough room. Yeah, to make that happen. And we're doing all of this with four technicians, guys. 
So imagine if I add another one more technician to the mix. Look at that. Yeah. Um, well, maybe I need to get a parts manager in at this point. How much is that going to cost me? Well, depending on the rate, that's going to eat into my profit a bit, but not that much. Did you see the change there? If I remove the parts manager, watch the profit number monthly. It goes down a bit, but that parts manager is actually going to juice my efficiency and make me way more than I'm paying. So yeah, kind of circling back to what we were talking about, like leading up to the people and people supporting techs. Yeah. It kind of starts to justify when you start to see it in the math and, and every math equation is different for every shop owner. But I think the compelling thing here is that if I'm a shop owner and I'm turning wrenches and I'm trying to manage inventory and I donate my weekends to building invoices, there's actually an ROI involved in getting me a service manager right. or, or getting me a parts manager who's aligned with the business to drive the revenue and get me out yes. of three jobs in one because I'm not going to be very good at three jobs. Once again, one. once again, why are people working at a shop if they are not a technician? They're there to increase the efficiency of the techs and you can see the massive impact that efficiency has on profitability. No other single factor has the kind of impact as efficiency has. So if you're hiring support staff, service managers, parts managers, office managers to make the techs more efficient, make sure that they're doing that and just recognize that you're going to get a huge return on that. Make sure that they're aligned with efficiency, but you're going to get an ROI. Yeah, you almost have to have it aligned with the business so you're not overcompensating and then causing yourself to go negative. Yeah, I, I think that you're right, Jacob, that we have some dials here in order to maybe fund it. Maybe I pull some of the levers with my rate. I evaluate the rate in the market. Maybe I evaluate my shop supplies. Definitely get a graduated markup scale. But then the next step, if I want to go or grow, I mean, it's a feast or famine out there. I'm going to have to deal with efficiency at some point and get everybody aligned to that. It's the yep. fastest way to get to profitability. Absolutely. So I, um, in fairness, I haven't been changing these overhead numbers. So if I just crank these up, what I'm going to do is just, I'm just going to get those way up. I'm going to take this to the level that we had in our, in our infographic right here, which is eight technicians, one service manager, one parts manager, and one office manager. I'm going to plug those numbers into our model. And we'll see what, what pops out. So eight technicians, and then I've got one. Watch what happens to my monthly profit number when I've got eight technicians running at 150% efficiency. There it is. And then now let's dial this down. If I'm, if I'm on the webinar and I'm participating, okay, well, let's get it to reasonable. Take it down to 125%. Take it back down to 50 hours. And let's just walk it down. It still looks great. Okay, let's take it down to just 40 hours. And then let's walk me back down to 35 hours. See the massive change. Going, look at this, going from 35 to 36 hours. Watch the change. See that? Massive. Per tech. Per tech. Making them one hour more efficient per week. You couldn't get enough parts markup to cover that. No. This is the single biggest lever. Um, well, the, the levers that control efficiency. Yeah. The, the biggest thing you can do for your profitability in a shop, make those guys efficient. So I dial up just a little bit. So, because yep. this is a tough, I mean, this is like, what do they say, eating the elephant at one time, or you can't, can't eat the whole pie. Yeah. One, I evaluate my labor rate, make sure I'm at market. If I can get a few more bucks, get a few more bucks, because that's going to help. Reevaluate, am I at least covering my cost on shop supplies? Maybe I should make a percent. So if I'm, if 4% is cost, I at least need to be at 5% of labor yeah. on shop supplies. Markup, graduated markup scale. Minimum, I would be putting in the full base scale or getting better than that, right? If the market bears it. Yep. And then I start working on teaching my techs how to log in, clock into work, and becoming very, very good at making sure that they're using full bay soup to nuts. Yep. And I'm in business and I start growing. Yes. And at the end of the day, we built full bay. Um, as a medical record for trucks, we built it for preventive maintenance tracking and for making the technicians more efficient. Um, so the efficiency tracking, all this stuff is baked in. Um, but there it is. That's the uh, the ideal, and obviously it's very, you know you guys in the call know how difficult it is to get the techs um, efficient. Um, but the tools are there, right? Are you using all the tools that are available to you? Would you have a technician remove a lug nut with a screwdriver? 
no, it's crazy. Right. Why would you do the same thing with other tools that are available? Make sure that you're that you're leveraging everything you can you can leverage with the aim to increasing this darn efficiency number because it is yeah. massive, massive yeah. impact. What's interesting too is the uh, we serve this up right on the tech home. So management has reporting. We serve up the tools on the tech home. And in addition to serving up the tools that show efficiency, we even show the efficiency in the dollar sign on the on the service order. So you can actually see if your techs are efficient right on that service order real time. So we're trying to layer it in so you're constantly thinking about it in the various roles. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think we've even been talking about our next step is parts manager efficiency, right? We've got a few customers that Want us to do the same thing What's with our parts manager on parts, yeah. And yeah. By extension, that makes the text more efficient. Um, we've got time for a few questions here. I've got a question here: Is this shop efficiency or tech efficiency? This is overall efficiency for the shop in this particular model. So it's going to be you know your blended efficiency across all the technicians. Um, uh, Luke says uh, poll showed five percent of all the attendees have over hundred percent. What's the number one thing to help improve efficiency? Um, I think it's getting the text. Uh, Continue to turn wrenches, so don't get, don't keep them standing around waiting for parts, waiting for authorization. Um, if you need to um, have two, every shop's different, but two bays for tech, one, uh, you know, one holding uh, the job that he's waiting on, and another one where he can continue working. Um, I think another key. big one is um, doing the PMs, um, negotiating with your customers that we want to take over everything on your fleet not just the, the general repairs. We want to be doing the PMs. Yes, it's gonna be a little more expensive than going to a lube shop, but we will be doing a thorough inspection every time we touch that truck. Um, we will help ensure this truck does not go down unscheduled. We will help minimize unscheduled. You know, you can make these arguments to them. And, um, and then for your benefit, well, when you're doing those PMs, you're doing these thorough inspections, you're finding things that are about to go wrong. Um, that you can also take care of while you're there doing the PM. It's just this virtuous cycle. Um, so that's a big one. Um, and you know, uh, one thing too to just add to that, some people don't have a shop that is jam packed, like they're lined up out the door. How do I make text more efficient if the work isn't lined up out the door? We have several tools. Um, you've got any estimates that you've written, the PM schedule, You've got pending repairs where customers have said no or I'll call you back, unscheduled work. I always say that those are sales tools. Mm -hmm. Those are sales tools for a service writer to use to reach out and be looking at the schedule two weeks from now and saying, is the schedule full? No. Nope. I'm going to start calling so-and-so at FedEx. Let's load up the pipeline. Let's load up the pipeline with the PMs. A lot of these shops are just waiting for it to walk in the door and then going, well, it's slow today, boys. Let's clean up. Yeah. No, no. You've got to be in front of it two days before, a week before. Keep that thing going out the front door to keep those techs more efficient. There's no way a shop empty with everybody standing around, we're not going to squeeze, squeeze blood out of the turnip, right? Right. You got to keep the doors rolling and turning and burning. Yep. Um, question here. Most of our work is custom work with no official suggested tech time. So we currently base our invoices mostly on the amount of time the techs take to do a job. Any tips to improve the scenario? Yeah, we see that a lot in custom work, um, yellow iron uh, construction work where there's not these published labor guides and standards. Um, you gotta get a feel for, and I get it, custom work, but you also, my two cents, right, for what it's worth, is you need to get a feel for what the average technician would take to do that job. If you've got a master tech who's very good um, burning through a job, in my personal opinion, and in line with um, the concept of labor guides, you're justified in charging a little bit more, a few more hours uh, than, uh, than what your good techs were able to do it in. Um, it, it goes into the whole formula of what's the incentive for a bad tech to get good and a good tech to get better, right? So you could drag everybody down. I see, I've seen that before where you have a master tech who can do things just, you know, they're doing jobs that take six hours and three hours because they've done a thousand of them. They're just really good and they bought all the tools. Yeah. You get somebody else who needs all six hours. I think you're right. You got to be fair to your customers. You don't want to be ripping off your customers. Right. But just question, like, if let's say you've got your best tech in the shop and your worst tech in the shop. Um, 
and they both do the exact same thing. One guy does it in four hours, one guy takes him eight hours to do. Are you really gonna bill your customer only four uh, and then right. turn around and bill them eight? eight. For the same you, job. Yeah, you might cut, I bet on the eight, you might be haircutting that to six, just for trying to be fair with your customer. But on the other hand, I bet you're not increasing it from four to six when the good tech does it. Right. Just think about that. You wanna be fair, you do not wanna rip off your customers, but you also have to protect your own interests and make yourself whole. And you've got a good valuable tech there. Just make sure that you're you're tracking them. It, it also goes to the whole concept of heavy duty labor guys, which we'll tackle tackle on. Yeah. Later. And your master tech or your senior techs cost you more anyway. I, I, you're going to have a guy at 35 or 40 and a guy at 15 or 20. One's going to take longer than the other. You know, just yeah. based on that sheer skill, right? And especially in Canada, where you have different levels of certification and apprenticeship. So. Yeah. Uh, sure, we still get on sound. You can still hear us okay? Okay. Um, we, uh, we're really excited to have talked about this. Um, got a few questions. Are we good to share the spreadsheet? We can, yeah, I mean, as, as do people want it? Is there is there anything that you guys want? Typically, I'll say, hey, I missed the webinar. Can you guys send this to me? Yeah, or, hit us up if you want a copy of it. And yeah. We'll get it out to you. Yeah, we'll run it through support. We're trying to make sure that we get the, the, the slide deck to support the PDF and stuff so they can respond faster. Uh, so, but yeah. Yeah, at the end of the day, you want to strive to get as close to the ideal as possible. Will you eventually get there? I don't know, but as long as you're trying to get as close as possible, um, you're going to be doing pretty good. And and uh, just remember, it's the efficiency. Yeah, and I think that if you know when you when you look at this, you, we can armchair quarterback this meeting a day from now, three weeks from now, whatever. If there's one takeaway from all of this. If you're just coming into work every day doing the grind and you're not thinking about these things and you're not thinking about that slide and where your numbers fit in, then you're not managing the business, right? And you possibly are leaving some money on the table. If all we did was get you to think about this and think about where you fit in, even if it, if it doesn't perfectly match your model, I think it's still a good exercise to be thinking in this mindset, reviewing what your profit numbers are, get your finance team, your accounting team, Lay it all out. Do Get the whole aligned. Yeah, everybody yeah. should be aligned on efficiency. Lay it all out. Think man. about doing an efficiency bonus for the parts manager, service manager, the office. Get those invoices out. You know, exactly. Let's, let's build stuff out. Um, so those are some ways you can dial up the efficiency. We always love talking about this. We'll do more webinars on efficiency, and and uh, it's a it, it's a fun subject, uh, but it's a winnable game. Well, we appreciate all the feedback. I mean, there is tons of feedback. We know that a lot of people aren't doing this. We're just trying to talk uh, about certain things that are near and dear to us. Uh, try to help you guys, and we appreciate the feedback that you've been giving us. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to keep doing it. Keep making the app better and better to help you be efficient. Yeah, that's the aim. And provide feedback. If you want to see something different, you want to see more, um, we're just trying to help because I don't know where there's a forum where people are just casually talking about it like this, trying to really help other right. shop not. owners run the business. It's more... You know, we've been to some, and they're not—they're not getting to the root of it. There's so no if we can help, we're happy to help. Absolutely. Uh, hit us up with any uh, other ideas you want to see, and with that, um, uh, we hit the questions. Thank you for your time, everybody. We really appreciate it, and uh, we'll get that spreadsheet out to everybody that is requesting it. And uh, for those of you who are full-way customers, we are very grateful to have you, and uh, we're working hard to uh, to continue to serve you guys, make your shops efficient, and help you guys. Um, have a great life. So we, uh, with that, uh, we will end and we'll talk to you guys next time. Thanks everyone. Thanks a lot.